The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? And I'm your host, Soraya, as always. And uh, this week on Where Did The Road Go? We had a little change up of schedule. We had originally planned on having Colin Andrew on. But uh, some stuff came up, and he's had to reschedule. Hopefully, before the end of the year, we'll have him on. And uh, in his place, uh, I had just conducted an interview with Christopher, or just about to conduct an interview with Christopher Jordan when uh, Colin had to cancel. So it worked out quite nicely. Christopher is uh, someone whose work I just recently found out about, thanks to uh, John over at Deprogrammed Radio. And uh, I've only read his most recent book, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is the Ark of the Covenant Operations Manual. Fascinating piece of work. So uh, Chris is going to be our interview for tonight. I hope you find it as interesting as I did. And uh, remember, you can always go to wheredidtheroadgo.com for uh, old shows. The whole archive is up. There's videos. We're going to be doing some video podcasts here, uh, maybe this week or next and uh, we'll hopefully be adding more of those on a fairly frequent basis as we go. Uh, I'll tell you more about it once we get it up and running. And uh, maybe we can share some uh, people's stories about their own paranormal uh, experiences and such. Uh, as for, that is, you know, for you people listening. So uh, you'll be able to call us up and uh, tell us your story and we'll turn it into a podcast. Yeah, at least that's the plan so far. All right. Uh, you can also give us a donation if you want to help us out because I intend on keeping everything free. So the archive as it is now goes all the way back to the very beginning. I intend on keeping it that way. Um, yeah. So if you, if you like the show and you want to help us out, give us a couple bucks. It would be really appreciated and it definitely helps out. So that being said, here's our interview with Christopher Jordan. And tonight we have joining us Christopher Jordan. How are you doing, Chris? Uh, very well there, sir. How are you? All right, and you're talking to, to us from where? Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Wow. All right, and uh, so how how long have you lived there? Uh, um, I've lived in Southeast Asia for about twenty years, but in Phnom Penh for the last ten or so. And you're originally from the UK, right? Yeah, yeah. Born in London, born and bred in London. <laughs> what what made you move to uh, Southeast Asia? Um, back in the 90s, I was doing a lot of odd work, which wasn't getting much joy in England because I was doing some biotech work. And in the UK, the focus was on genetics because of the genome project, etc. And I was looking at the way things develop. And I came out here because there's a wider scope to deliver this sort of stuff. And I published a paper out here on developmental biology. Ex- Extending the uh, forms and solutions that Alan Turing did originally. Oh wow! Okay. Um, now you've had you have a bit of a scientific history behind you. Hmm. Yeah, I'm a, a cross disciplinary scientist. Very broad base of science, the math, chemistry, and physics, and spread that into computing biotech, as I just said, and into solar technology. Hmm. And you, you discovered alcohol in... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I did, man. <laughs> we all <laughs> when we were teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I, when I was at uh, university, I was studying under um, Sir Harold Croto, absolutely brilliant guy, genius in, in the making, and we were studying deep space, the microwave data from deep space, and we just did the analysis that showed that there was piles of alcohol out there. Wow, really, really weird sort of thing. Some guy a few years later discovered how big that part of alcohol was, alcohol was, and made all the press. But huh. uh, Croto was finding, you know, Croto is the guy who discovered uh, graphene. He's the grandfather of the 21st century tech nanotechnology. He was finding uh, buckyballs out in space. 
And so, really? so we were doing a side project on alcohol. Huh. All right. So you, you definitely come from a scientific background in approaching this sort of alternative theories of different things here. I tend to know what works and what doesn't work. And, uh, I, well, there's a lot of things that don't work in the alt community. And, uh, well, you study the ancient world, and there seems to be two, two fields, aren't there? There's the mainstream and there's the alt. And I try and work in the middle of the two. Because the mystery mm. guys or the alt community find an awful lot of interesting things that aren't really dealt with very well by the mainstream. And the mainstream deals well within the bounds of science, within the bounds of history. I mean, they're very practical about things and pragmatic. They work with evidence, physical evidence and physical tools you can prove. Whereas the orc community tends to, well, go off where it can. <laughs> well, it, 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 also, it also seems that the mainstream community is a little stuck sometimes when new ideas come along. Indeed, indeed. It takes them a long time to, well, to accept any new ideas at all. And yeah. even, even if they do see it working, it's still like, well, there, there's certain rules that historians have to abide by, which can't upset the status quo too much. Yeah. And if you've yeah. done History 101, you'll know what they are. Now, and how many books have you written? Um, about four or five. Okay. There's the... The main one is the ancient solar premise, which deals with the way the ancients used solar technology. They weren't worshipping the sun, they were effectively using solar technology. The energy mm. of the sun eventually became a religion or, or a, a ritualized way of using the sun. And I go through a lot of the evidence and the devices from the old world which use solar energy to work covers a whole okay. vast area of technologies. And uh, we're going to be talking about one of those mainly tonight, which is the Ark of the Covenant. Indeed, indeed. The ancient solar premise as applied to the Ark. And uh, what, what got you interested in the Ark? Um, it was just a sideline from the solar premise, to be honest. I mean, a lot of the techniques that I pulled out of the archaeological record for, for the solar premise, they are used in the Ark. And the Ark is a beautiful illustration of these small, it's a community size illustration of these applications. Whereas the solar premise is more of a industrial scale. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and the, the uh, there, there are a bunch of arcs. There's not just one arc. Uh, they're all over the place, man. <laughs> you find them in um, Masonic lodges which is an interesting place. The Grand Hall and the Masonic Lodge will have a copy of the Ark. There's the Coptic Christian churches, which most people know about in Ethiopia, that virtually all, well, tens of thousands of them carry an Ark in their pride of place. And also in the synagogues. The synagogues have a copy of the Ark, along with the outline of the tabernacle. So you've literally got tens of thousands of sites all over the world, or hundreds of thousands of sites. <clears throat> all over the world where you have copies of the Ark. Most people are fascinated or are interested where the original is, as we know. Now, is it the original or were there Arks around before the Ark of the Covenant? They're all over the place. There's the Ark of Amon, Amun, in Egypt, which is the archetype for the Ark. And this is where I believe the technology came from. I mean, Moses supposedly came out of the priest class in Egypt and brought with him, or the people around him, brought the technology with them. So we have arcs actually in the tombs of the pharaohs. Hmm. Okay, and uh, one was found in Tutankhamun's tomb, right? Several. Several? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, they don't actually... <laughs> They don't actually let you open up these boxes and look inside them generally. But when, when I've seen the, the, the Ark is a portable version of the solar shrines of the steppe pyramids of Egypt. And so when they're going out chasing whatever they chase, animals or on safari, they take the Ark and these little Ark boxes and they use them exactly the same way as the exilic Israelites did. <clears throat> and they have the same form. So you have a golden box and a dark stone in the base. Hmm. They have a, there, there's other types, some which are 
used in the morning, which have vertical doors, some which are used in the afternoon, which point to the west, some point to the east. It's just a matter. So, sorry, go. No. Uh, so, what is the ark? The ark. It's a shiny box <laughs> with a couple <laughs> of stones in the bottom, which is, is not much. <laughs> the, the ark itself, I mean, we sit, sit there with the story of Moses in the, on the trip through the desert for 40 odd years. And everybody knows the story of, our, of Moses on the mountain, the Ten Commandments and the burning bush, etc. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the key items in the ark story in the story is the ark itself which a couple of guys who were i'm not sure exactly what they were but they, they were in they're in the story the one was called Bez bezalel and oholiab and these guys actually make the ark and they tell tell you the dimensions and how to physically make it which is in the old testament everybody can make one yeah, but this story has been revered because of these wonderful feats, the miraculous feats of Moses. And the ark itself is nothing more than a box with a couple of stones in it, as the OT says. I myself add something to the top of it. There's something called the mercy seat, which <clears throat> is the summit of the box. And this is common to the Egyptian arks as well. And they have, they say the god Aten or Tem resided in the mercy seat between the two angels. Now the angels in Egypt or in the Masonic lodges for that matter, they, they held up a strange object which in effect had all the properties that delivered the miracles. And in my view, this is a, a sun dish. Yeah. Hmm. You, you want to explain to people a little what a sun dish is? A sun dish, you see them all over the ancient world. They're, they're, they're literally just mirrors, slightly curved mirrors that concentrate sunlight. A shaving mirror is a hmm. simplest version. It's a very flat curve, you, but you can get deeper curves which focus the sunlight closer, make the beam stronger. Yeah, uh, and we, we see this technology in every museum. You can't find a museum that doesn't have a vanity mirror in it. And a vanity mirror effectively d demonstrates the technology. <clears throat> so we've got hundreds, well, maybe thousands, thousands of these curved mirrors all over the ancient world. Egypt, in particular, they have, um, they're called attends in Egypt. And this is the technology, I believe, delivered the ark. Uh, hmm. delivered the art miracle, sorry. The art okay. is something else. But if, you look, <laughs> if you look at the other, other stories that go with the art, yeah, that, you know, there, there's how many is it? About half a dozen theories on the art. Yeah? We have the radioactive one, which right. God knows how that delivered the feet of the art. I mean, <laughs> might have killed a few people, <laughs> but I don't know how it knocks down the walls of Jericho or burns the bush. Right. Then you have the electrostatic one. Now, I'm no, <laughs> no expert on electrostatics, but what exactly did they use the electrostatics for? I mean, they didn't have any use for electricity. People think, oh, you touch it, you get electric shock. Yeah? But, uh, you know, electrostatics, you're not going to get a very big electric shock. It might make your hair stand on end, but not much more. Yeah? Now, then there was dynamite, of all things, when Nobel invented dynamite. Yeah. He, okay. The dynamite was associated with the power of the ark. Yeah. That one I hadn't heard before. Uh, the, the, the theories associated with the ark, they kind of follow the developments in technology and science. You know, whenever somebody comes up with something new, it gets dumped against the ark. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the radioactive one is probably Oppenheim when he said, we have the power of 10 million suns. And so you go with, oh, the ark was very powerful, so maybe they had it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's probably why we stick with God <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. It's as good an explanation as any. But there are some which do work. There's some guys that do the arc where, say, the writing in stone with the finger of God, they suggest that the finger of God is a chisel. 
an iron chisel that can write in granite, which is well, it's a fair, it's a fair question or fair answer. Then there's the guy who suggested that the burning bush was caused by an earthquake releasing gases, and a spark right. ignites the bush. Yeah. Which again is a fair, fair, fair idea, but exactly, where was the earthquake? I mean, no, there's no mention of it. Yeah. True. True. Same with Jericho, the walls of Jericho being knocked down. So no mention of an earthquake, but the ark's present. Yeah? Hmm. But they, these ideas, I mean, these ideas, they explain maybe one or two elements. The way the, the solar premise does it, it explains a lot of them. They're not just one or two. It goes through the strange ideas that are associated with the ark. Yeah? Whereas okay. these, these, these guys, they do one thing and that's it. Do you, do you want to get into a little bit of that, the ancient solar premise and how it explains it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The arc, the arc chest itself is, it, as I said, it's just a shiny box with a couple of dark stones in the base. Now, we don't, we don't have the physical box to check this against, but the references are pretty clear in the Old Testament. And it's gold, gold plate on the inside, gold on the outside, acacia wood... Um, body, shiny lid. The stones, we're not, we're not sure what colour the stones were. If you read the Talmudic text, they say they were sapphire stones. Now, if they were sapphires, they would be the biggest sapphires we'd ever seen. To write the <laughs> Ten Commandments on the, on the two sapphires is pretty impressive work. But <clears throat> it gives us a clue as to the colour. The sapphires are generally red or pink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I take this box, I build copies of it. A small arc. Just exactly the same. Shiny box. I don't use gold, I just use tin foil. I don't use acacia wood. I just use a ice box. I did use I did do a small wooden box at one stage. I go with the ice box. So I just take this box with the dark stones in it, take it onto my roof, open it up, and leave it to warm in the sun. And of course, the stones will get hot. Yeah. Okay. It's ex the exact copy of any pizza box cooker. <laughs> it, it's the same. Now, it's, <laughs> I laugh at the idea, just as you do. It's all right, just as you do. I think it's funny. We have a solar cooker. Why the, Why is it so revered? I mean, I, I take it, I made bread in it, I made biscuits, made all manner of things, did potatoes, just whatever you could put, want to do. Just open it up, let it heat in the sun, the stones get hot, then put your food in, shut the lid and it cooks. Hmm. Yeah. It's not as exciting as radioactivity or black holes or the other straight dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> but it is useful. In the oh, certainly. In the desert, what else do you need? Fruit. Food and water. Food and water. And the, the, uh, the food associated with the tabernacle, which is where the ark resided, is showbread. Now, I don't see any other, other ovens in this, this story. So there's flatbreads, which you just put onto the... There's, there's bread racks, gold bread racks, which are described in the Old Testament. You put the dough on the bread racks and drop that in the oven. It will cook the bread. They still do this today on dark stones. When I was in Egypt at uh, Edfu, I saw people just laying out just patties of dough onto dark, flat stones in the sun. It cooks it. It's not like your modern breads with the, the leavened bread. This is unleavened bread. So it's like um, Indian naan bread, you know, the flat breads. OK, right. Uh, it's simply cooked. That's hmm. it. And what else are the Israel Israelites needing in the desert? Free energy to cook. Yeah. They would not survive otherwise. Outside of the tabernacle itself, they had a brazier cooking the meats. It's associated with food. And if you look to the solar premise, a lot of the work is, is focused on the food industry industrial levels. Yeah? You want to get into that a little bit? 
Um, that, that, <laughs> that's a very broad area. But th this is just a small example of it. This mm -hmm. arc, the Ark of Amun, was actually placed in the step pyramids of Egypt, where this te you know, the technology comes from Egypt. There's references to the Ark of Amun, which is mentioned by Herodotus in histories. Now, he um, talks about it being settled in the sanctuary, the inner sanctuary of the steppe pyramids, which is what I find all over Asia, exactly the same. Dark stones in these in inner sanctums of these steppe pyramids. They're still here. They still heat up every day. So the ark, was, the ark or the stones in particular, were used on an industrial level. <clears throat> Yeah, but this is not going to get you to your miracles. Right. Well, it delivers one miracle, how you survive in the desert. <laughs> Fair enough. But the miracles themselves, that they come from another ark. And as I said before, that on top of the ark itself, there sits an Aten. If you look at the Masonic versions of the ark, they have a picture of the winged cherubs golden right. cherubs supporting the sun. And th this is a very common image across the Middle East, in fact. In fact, it's common across South America, anywhere where they use this technology, and it's the sun with wings. So, in, in effect, the cherubs were supporting a sun dish. And the Egyptians call this the mercy seat. Now, the sun dish has the properties that deliver the feats of the ark. Now, what are the feats of the ark, in my eyes? The ones most people know about are the writing of the Ten Commandments, the associations with Solomon's temple, and basically killing people. Right. Yeah, which I believe you can do with the Aten. But there's more. Okay. There's more than that. You've also got the burning bush, which you can live with the, uh, with the Aten. You can deliver the voice of God, the finger of God. You can inscribe in these stones. You can cut stones. Halos all emerge from this technology. And I even produced the, the physical images of what they call the Shamir worm, which is also associated with Solomon's temple. This is a dynamic beast, neither living nor dead. But it can cut through anything. And that's a hmm. strange thing in the ancient world, but the Aten, delivers. <clears throat> okay. So the Aten is, is just a, simply a curved dish, a, a parabolic dish. You point it at the sun, all the sun is focused to a point. That point is incredibly intense. Uh, the, the dishes I've been making and using hit intensities higher than industrial lasers. Wow. Yeah. Well, the industrial laser five five megawatts per square meter <laughs> intensity, and mine are measured at 15 megawatts per square meter. And wow. on, on a, and it, it just goes through anything. And that's just from sunlight? Just from sunlight, yeah. But it wasn't until, until about the 70s or 80s that the super lasers surpassed this sort of power. Now, if you're sitting in, mm. in the ancient world and you've got a beam that is that intense, there's some wonderful things you can do with it. <laughs> I would suppose so. And you can, um, <laughs> well, you can imagine people might revere it a bit more than a solar oven. Yeah. So if you start with the, with the stuff that you can do, the bush, yeah, the burning bush. Everybody likes burning bush. No earth moving this time, but we just point the dish at the sun and place the bush or put the bush between the sun and the dish at the focal point. It will set on fire. It's very quick. You can do it with a piece of paper. People have used a magnifying glass to burn ants or burn paper. Do exactly the same, but it's going through the glass as opposed to being reflected back. Right. Yeah? Okay. And you know how quickly, well, I don't know if you do know, but it's very easy to set fire to things with a magnifying glass just as it is with a dish. Just use the sun, focus the light, yeah? Okay. So you hit the bush. Now, the voice of God, the parabolic mirrors also have another wonderful property. They can focus sound. If you put a, if you put a sound source at the focal point, 
pointed at the dish, all the sound will come back in a tube of sound. And you can point that wherever you like. You may, huh. have, you may have used directional mics in your job or directional speakers. They use exact right. same technology, just a parabolic reflector. And, and there are some, some buildings that we've built today that have this, this as an effect. Such as? Uh, well, uh, you mentioned them in the book. There's certain areas where you can talk in one spot and hear it on the other end of the building. Yeah, in the British Museum, they have two conical shells, and you can whisper into one, and the other one's like 50 yards away, and you can hear the other person whispering. They do it in certain buildings. The St. Paul's Cathedral has the whispering gallery because of the shape, shape of the room. The, the voice exactly opposite you carry is directly to you. The same, the same technique can be used to project a voice. So you, there's two times when Moses is looking for a sign from God to convince the patrons, for want of a better word. And strangely, they can both be done with this dish. Burning bush, <laughs> voice of God. Now, it might have been the voice of God, might have been a sign from God. I don't know, but strangely, you can do these things with this dish. So if that's the case, would you say that he was just kind of conning them then? I don't know. I don't think Moses was a party to this. Oh. You see, the, the, uh, there's two, the two other guys I mentioned, and Aaron, the guy who ended up heading the tabernacle. They seem to have done a lot better out of the story than him. True. So they may have been more up in the priest class of Egypt, the class, priest class of Akhenaten, and they might have brought the technology and just used it in the same way as it had been used in Egypt. Because these, these hmm. things have been used in Egypt for a long time, keep people cow-cowing to the sun gods. Right. Yeah. I mean, people wore these dishes on their heads. You see them in the museums. There's hundreds of statues where you see a a demigod wearing a dish on the back of his head. Sun bounces off the dish and goes straight out into the person in front of him. Now that will also blind you if you're in front of him. And the, Which it, go on. The, the, the face of God. In many cultures they say, do not look into the face of God. Well, if, you, if the god or demigod is a sun god and he's wearing a dish, you don't want to be looking at that if there's the sun in front or behind you because you'll get burnt or blinded. I've had it happen to me several times and it is not nice. You lose your eyesight, you, lose, <laughs> you, you get skin rashes, it's not good. Huh. Right? It's scary. I mean, it makes me so mad. <laughs> <with hands. laughs> and that's when the dish is at an angle. I mean, I'm not putting my face in when the beam is at its full power. Just when the beam shifts over the side of the dish, when the sun's at an angle to the dish, I wouldn't want to be there in, when the dish is pointed directly at the sun. A friend, a friend, a friend was crazy enough to do it when, with a, a mirror, just a vanity mirror, he pointed it at the sun, and he thought it'd be like putting your hand over a match. He put his hand in the beam, and it, lasted, it didn't last a second. It was out. It stung, went straight through his hand. <laughs> didn't burn it, but it, it, the pain is intense. Yeah, it's, huh. like, it's like a bee sting with, with a vanity mirror, but really deep bee sting. But you get that in your eye, you, you'll go blind. I think that's where the smiting the eyes comes from, smite out the eyes. You can hmm. blind something you, you, intensely, yeah? You, you also give a fascinating example of uh, how that might have been part of the Medusa tale. Yeah, certainly th this story is not just about Moses. The, the solar premise is so broad. There's so many stories that come up under this big umbrella. The Medusa tale, it, you know, we have Jason and the Argonauts, great story. Jason goes in to see Medusa. He knows of other people who've been in there. And they meet Medusa in her sanctuary. She's sitting there, looks in her face. Uh, anybody who looks in her face turns to stone. Now, if you go blind in a non-benign environment, what are you? You're just going to stand still. Uh, I, I believe this is used in battle as well. So uh, there's these images of people b being blinded and just getting stuck still, you know, in the middle of some dangerous place. And Medusa just come up with a sword, chop, chop their heads off. Right now, 
turning to stone. She's got all these statues around her. You combine the two and you can imagine how the hearsay goes. <clears throat> right, right, right. And, yeah. and you mentioned that, you know, once he chopped her head off, he was, he was wielding it around and turning others to stone with it, which could have been because she had the parabolic dish on her head. Exactly. That, I mean, that, if, it, if she was a god and he just killed her, presumably it wouldn't work, but a dish will work whoever's carrying it. Yeah, right. And uh, well, there's the story of Solomon when the Temple of Solomon was raided, and the only thing they stole was the shields. Now, shields are big parabolic metal dishes, or big curved mm. metal dishes. I can't prove they were parabolic, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of this this technology was used in the ancient battles. The, the stories of the Greeks are awash with brazen steel, brazen shields, shiny helmets. And people, there was one, one story where 2,000 people went blind during a battle. It's, hmm. And they go back to the camp, they're all blind. Now, you're flashing a lot of light around, they even have a lot of blind people. <laughs> It, well, yeah. yeah. You see, you see well, this, this is the offensive use of the Aten. Now, the, the stories of people dying from the, the Ark, yeah, it's strange. I don't know if you've ever met a demigod. Have you ever met a demigod? Have you ever seen a living god? I mean, not, not, not that I'm aware of. Well, I have, or some people consider a living god. It's the uh, king of Thailand, and he's been a, a living god, literally a living god, to, in the view of the older people of Thailand for, since the 40s and 50s. And so when they see him, he's, the effect is just amazing. You see these people falling down in lines in front of him, a bit like David Beckham or some other star you might care to mention. <laughs> but this... That's a person, that's a demigod, a living god. Now, if your god is the sun, and you open a box, and you see the sun jumping out of you, a big ball of intense light, it may well give you a heart attack. I don't know if that explains the story of the guy that died who touched the box or whatever, but it's certainly a possibility in my eyes. Hmm. But that's, it's just, these are strange ways that you can use these dishes to hurt. But they have more intrinsically useful uses. And it'd be nice to get onto a couple of those, I suppose. But okay, go on. The, we have the finger of God. Now, the, this guy, the guy who explained it with the iron chisel, I think it's a fair explanation. But it's not very hmm, dynamic. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, the finger of God was, actually could write in stone. It, it was used to write the um, Ten Commandments on the Mount. Now, I've actually written in stone with these devices. And it's not easy, but there, there's several techniques which I describe in, in quite a bit of detail in the solar premise. But I, I run over the ones I believe they could have used on the Mount. And if you point the light of a, at a stone, it will change. And the stones I was doing, they're actually changing to glass. So I was putting tracks of glass on stone. Now, now this, this technique can be controlled in several ways. You can use stencils, or the best way, which, which seems to be described in the Old Testament. I, I didn't even know that you could do it this way until I'd read the, the detail in the Old Testament. They talk of, they write on the stones, and then they expose the stones to the finger of God, or to the ark, mm -hmm. and this actually inscribes in the stone. Now, I, I tried it with ceramic paints, and you write on a stone in ceramic paint and, and then put the beam on that ceramic. It will leave the ceramic in the, in the stone. You can cover the whole stone in a ceramic paste and do it bit by bit and change the stone surface to something akin to sapphire, which might explain the sapphire stones which the Talmudic text, text come up with. <clears throat> Now, there's some other strange things that come from this story. They say that the letters were reversed on the other side of the stone, on the other side of the tablet of stone, a bit like if you use a thick pen on a piece of paper, you can see the writing on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, when I had done certain stones, like um, sandstone, when I take the track of the beam, the track of the beam actually goes through the stone. 
So you can see exactly the same on the other side of the stone as you put on the front. Which you could reverse the letter. There's even ways of turning them back to front and upside down, this sort of thing. But you certainly have an impact on the other side of the stone. Now, I don't know an iron chisel that does that, or any other device for that matter. But these, yeah. these beams are so intense, they heat the stone up so, so locally, it literally goes through the stone. Depends on the thickness. Obviously, if you have a meter-wide piece of stone, it won't go all the way down to the bottom. But a thin piece, a tablet of stone, you know, there's every possibility you can go straight through it. I was going through half-inch thick lumps of stone with the beam. So the front was, huh. the front was turned a different color where the beam had been, so at the back. Which might explain the re reversing of the letters. You can do this with stencils. You can do it with charcoal. Uh, if you've got a white stone, you can actually turn parts of that to, to melt using charcoal because the charcoal absorbs the heat. Yeah, so we, there's, there's several techniques. I don't know which one they used or even if they did it this way, but with this dish, you can do these sorts of things. Yeah? So you can inscribe right. in the stone. You can do it at tiny levels. There, there's the story of the, the two gems, oh, hang on, is it six gems or 12 gems that they put on the priest's guard? Oh, yeah, and these they yeah. inscribed the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, they inscribed the names of the tribes. But, I mean, to to inscribe on a gem. I mean, you can imagine the sort of effort <laughs> or effort right. made, the detail. But if you're using a ceramic paste and then heating it, it's not so difficult. And I, I've done gems. I've done partial gem change changes and full gem changes. I mean, you can just do parts of it, which is something that the modern Gemini, was, they have no idea because they heat the whole stone. Yeah? Hmm. And, and I would assume this would be an art form after a point. Well, it, seems to, it seems to become that way, but they also used it for sealing, um, sealing bricks. Uh, in, uh, there's a guy, Jean-Peter de, de Jong, I wrote a paper with him on vitrified stone. And this is, this is a strange, this is an anomaly in the record. They have literally like mortar made of glass in Peru, in Cuzco. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And there's no way to do that. I mean, today, uh, no, nobody's got even an idea, so it's just, it's not, it's not glass. <laughs> it's not vitrified stone. But he, he did an analysis, which I wrote the paper on the analysis with him. And it turns out it is glass. It's exactly glass. And not only that, they put the glass onto the surface of limestone, which if you heat, will crack. Huh. So they're using ceramic paste, heating it up just very locally, and then not d destroying the limestone beneath, which wow. is quite a feat. But again, you can do this with these dishes. And I've done it. You, you, can, see, you see on my photographs on uh, Facebook or in the books, uh, there's tracks of, tracks of glass just on a stone. Just let the beam travel. And we found these mirrors in South America as well. Yeah, there's great stories of the South Americans. The largest one I've ever heard of was in South America. They talk about a dish twice the height of a man, which would be three or four meters high. Wow. Which is just enormous. It's just yeah, what's, Sorry, yeah. What, what is the official story of what these mirrors were used for? Like everything in the old world, it's um, sacred. <laughs> it's just <laughs> religious, it's ritual. No, no practical use. I mean, it's like, if it's not a tomb, it's a sacred object, yeah? Right. In Egypt, the same thing. These, these objects are ritual objects. Yeah, that's all they're used for. You know, some, they did something in the rites of Ra, and that's how they were used. There's no practical use for them, but I mean, these things deliver beams as intense of an, as an industrial laser. But, you know, I'm going to probably use it as a laser. <laughs> it's... <laughs> I mean, th these things, I, mean, I, I don't actually know how to do these things. Some I did by mistake, yeah? Mm. I was just okay. throwing stones in and seeing what happened. Yeah, and some interesting, so some split. I couldn't stop the stones splitting originally, yeah? Ah. Uh, every time I put them in the beam, they split. But then, then you, have, you have stories of, where's it, from Solomon's Temple. They cut the stones without iron or metal. Well. You could use a rock, like the conventional wisdom suggests, but you can also 
just point these beams straight at the ground, you use a second mirror, and you heat the stone, it will crack. Wow. Virtually any stone. Now, this technique is, is not, it's, it, the mainstream, mainstream accepts this technique. You know, there's the Romans, they used to quarry by heating up piles of rock, and then throwing water on it and watching it crack. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very old, old technique. There's, the guys in China, they built a 300-mile canal through granite and bedrock. And they said, fortunately, the Chinese, they actually wrote down how they did it. And they put fires all the way along it, heated up with the fires, and obviously the stone underneath just cracks under the heat, or they throw the water on. Now you can right. do exactly the same with this. So <clears throat> the problem I was having, all these stones cracking, is actually a, a masonry technique. And after I had read the Old Testament, I realized you could actually do lines. And so I, try, I tried it on a tile with a shaving mirror and literally just pa painted a black line where I wanted the cut to go and exposed that to the beam and the tile just cracks along that line. Hmm. So, so you just mark out where you want the crack to go and expose that to the heat. Simple. All right, well, we got to take a quick break. We will be back in a minute with Christopher Jordan. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, and we are back with Christopher Jordan here on Where Did the Road Go? We've been talking about uh, what the Ark of the Covenant may have actually been, and we've been mostly talking about the parabolic mirror that, that may have been on top in the uh, mercy seat. Indeed. Well, I, I use the scientific principle. If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. So if it can, <laughs> if it can deliver the, the feats of the Old Testament, the things that are associated or closely associated with the Ark, I'm saying it's probably what the Ark was. Right, now, right. And, and you make a very convincing argument for this as well, whereas a lot of other people can explain one or two of the miracles and just kind of dismiss the other ones. Well, the best thing about this one is you can do it yourself. You don't have to yeah. find your radioactive electricity. You don't have to find your electrostatically perfect uh, environment or climate. You, you can do this yourself. I mean, a shaving mirror is what I use to cut the tiles. I mean, wow. Then that's, you know, it's a six, seven inch shaving mirror. And one of the things you can do in the book, you say, is you can just add more and more mirrors to this configuration, and it just makes the beam stronger and stronger. Yeah, the, the way I believe, well, in, the, in Exodus, they talk of the, the ladies giving up their vanity mirrors for the art construction. Now, I've built some, there's several ways to build a curved mirror. Some people use mosaics on curved surfaces. Some people carve a curved surface and then cover it with a reflective um, metal. I, I've tried all of the tried all of these methods, but there's a really nice one, a novel one. Where you just take a few shaving mirrors, seven, one in the middle, and then you put six around it and tilt them up slightly. And obviously, when you point out the sun, the the mirrors will all point their beam to the same place, or you try to get them to all point to the same place. And it makes a nice little swirly focal point, very similar to a worm, which is essentially what they call, the, there's a, the, the secondary part of the ark story goes to Solomon's temple where they have the Shamir, which is again another mythical object that's founded from the ark. But it's described in a bit more detail. It says it can cut anything. Yeah, it's about the size of a, a, a grain of barley. And it's, they describe it as the Shamir worm. You, know, you touch anything with it, and it'll, go, it'll break it. It doesn't matter what the object is. It'll, it'll go through it. And this story, it's a very 
well, it was very close to what I've been doing. And when I take pictures of that beam, when I use a series of circular dishes in a mosaic form, it looks exactly like a worm. And it has the same effect. You put them together, you get a couple of megabit, a couple of megawatts of power out of it. But with the, the curved dishes, you can get up to 15, 20. In fact, I think you can get a lot higher, but I haven't had the wherewithal to do that yet. <laughs> uh, okay. Hundreds of mega, mega, mega watts of power, which will touch anything. It'll go through it. The beautiful thing about this, it's not even dependent on the size. If you make a big mirror it, and a small mirror, they can have the same intensity, but the beam is just smaller. Ah, so you make okay. a, a big mirror and it can have a five centimeter wide uh, beam point. Or you make a small mirror with a one centimeter wide beam point. And if the, the size of the mirror doesn't matter, it's the concentration ratio of the sunlight to the beam point. Uh, okay. There's, okay. A, there's a lot of math in that. I don't want to get into the math. People hate That's the math fine. of it. Yeah. <laughs> People hate the math of it. I mean, we've done most of them. There's a halos. You know, you know, strangely, the, the sign of power in most of the world, especially for gods and demigods or what have you, is the halo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you see these guys wearing these dishes on their heads in Egypt, and you look at them, and there's a halo of light around the head. It's like your Christmas pageant or your Christmas play where the kids are wearing strange things on their head to pretend to be angels. I, th I think it's based in a reality of sorts, where the people just had these dishes behind their head. And there's a strange circle of light behind their heads, like shining heads. So you get halos. So you've got a whole list of things there. I mean, these other theories, they pick one or two things. Some of them predict things. So you've got God, which does a lot. But here, right. we've, got, we've got the burning bush. We've got the voice of God, the finger of God. We've got the sapphire stone, the, the Urim, Urim and Turim, Tumin stone. We've got cutting stones. We've got the face of God. We've got halos. We've got the shamir worm. And a lot of the detail that goes with it. Now, now you, it's quite like a have, duck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you say they, they have used this to build the Temple of Solomon stonework. Well, they, they describe the techniques that, and the device properties. And it, it comes across as exactly the same. And the Talmudic texts, they actually relate the Shamir, or Samir, depends on which stories you read. There's so many names of these things. That they really relate that back to the, the Moses story. And they, they put the two together, they bind the two together. And I, I do it. And all the, all the properties, all the techniques, they're all there. Right. Well, let, let me ask you this. Is it possible that... Uh, the, these cutting techniques were used in like things like the pyramids or some of these odd walls in South America and stuff that people have such a hard time explaining how they cut some of these blocks? Some of them. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's uh, people, you know, most, most all t all theorists, they go on, on a run and everything comes under it. But I, I say it's just one technique amongst a whole gamut of techniques. Mm, okay. Yeah. The, the, the great cuts or the, the, the great cuts where they go down through stone at half a centimetre return, these sorts of things. I don't think that's got anything to do with arcs, so though you can. You can cut stones like that. It's very quick to cut stones like this. Yeah? Very quick. Okay. But those, those techniques, there's a lady called Frances Lindblad who put me on to how that technique was done with the, they call it slag stone. Yeah? I, I always re rejected those ideas. They had soft stone because you have to heat up the whole stone. And people suggested that you use the arc to heat up the whole stone, but you'd be sitting there a long, long time. Now, <laughs> if you think of the ancient world, they did heat stone up to high temperatures and melted it for refining process. And the, right. the byproduct was slag stone, which is liquid stone. Mm -hmm. And you can put that into casts. You can drill holes in it when it's still, still liquid. Some, some of it's actually hot, some of it's just actually a liquid paste. The one Davidovitz, he, he actually drops to it, in, he doesn't refer to it extensively, but he notes that um, Portland cement comes from the process. 
Yeah. So they did have plenty of plenty of molten stone or liquid stone, which they could cast or do whatever they like with. I mean, that that's another technique. I mean, there's a lot of banging going on with the chisels. They, right. they, they, they could have quarried a lot with these. I've seen quarries where they actually have the the marks that give away the fact they've used heat. And yeah. I don't know if there's any other way to explain it, but in Egypt there's quarries and they have a straight cut along the edge of a piece of granite. And obviously the stone's been extracted. But that cut has a red line right along it. And that's exactly what I get when I hit granite at a particular temperature. It turns red, dark black granite turns red when you heat it with a sun dish. And oh. in these quarries in Egypt, they actually have pictures of the stone stone edge when it's still got a red line alongside it. So I, I'm pretty sure they used it at some stages, but it's certainly not extensively used. I think the, the Ark, or the Aten, was kind of kept secret for good reason. Okay. Um, you want to get into how it affected the walls of Jericho? Walls of Jericho, yeah. Well, strangely, <laughs> I, didn't, I don't have that one on my list. But yeah, the walls of Jericho. I, I mean, I'd taken concrete, put it in the beam. It turns to powder. Limestone turns to powder. So does adobe. I mean, the walls of Jericho are made of adobe brick, apparently. You heat that up and then let it cool very quickly. Heat it up, let it cool very quickly. It will just crumble, and you can you can actually adjust the distance that these beams go. I found a limit of about 15 to 20 meters, where you could actually focus the beam as an offensive weapon. And if you're wandering around the siege city, you, if you get close enough, you can get 15 meters. You can heat that wall, crumble it, and it will bring down the walls of Jericho. As simple as that. I mean, a concrete goes. Modern wow. concrete. Coral, limestone, I mean, it just falls in, turns to dust, literally. Oh, no, it almost seems dangerous to, to even tell people about this. <laughs> well, if I had the choice of a, a burning <laughs> mirror or a gun, I think I'd choose the gun. <laughs> well, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not going to be a weapon today. They are dangerous well, to use. I mean, I have a lot of... A lot of safety tips about using this stuff. I mean, I violated a few of them myself when I was using the device, but you, you have to be very careful. You do more damage to yourself than anybody else, to be honest. Well, well, that, that's what I mean. If people want to play around with it, they got to be very careful, uh, you know, not to, as you said, you got it right into the face, and that, that was obviously not pleasant. Yeah, yeah, it's a horrible thing to happen. But, I mean, if, if you're a scientist and you want to play with... Uh, sort of high energy flux levels, there's no cheaper way. I mean, hmm. to get high temperature, I mean, 3,000 degrees, some people tell me they get with these dishes. I've seen, there's videos in the book which show things going through steel. I mean, big modern modern versions of the same idea, and they go through steel as easy as, easy as look at it. Yeah, and it goes through it like butter. When I, I've used the, my dishes to actually go through most metals and fused steel with stone, which I don't know if you've seen those mysterious stones with advanced technology, but they have them in South America where you have steel, or not steel, a metal literally fused with a stone, and I did it by accident yeah. with steel. I mean, huh. steel, I mean, it's at 1,500 degrees or more. Interesting. So that, that, that it may be a key into to figuring out the technology that was used in building some of these things. Yeah, indeed. The, the solar panels, the breadth of it, it answers a, an awful lot of mysteries in the in the alt community, and it stays within the bounds of science. When you you, yeah. can, you can run these tests yourself, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, any anybody can build a solar cooker, make it look like an ark, if you like. Anyone can use a, a vanity <laughs> mirror to burn a bush. I mean, you've done it with a magnifying glass; it's no different. Right. All right, well, you want to you want to get a little bit into the Davidic prophecy. Um, Davidic prophecy. That's uh, but there's lots of implications that come from the this technology. I mean, it, they come from the uh, the other theories. I mean, if if the ark was radioactive, does that mean God is radioactive? Mm. Was, was God dynamite? But I mean, Egypt they had the sun god. 
So we're, we're in the bounds of the ancient gods, yeah? Now, the implications for... I, I, I want, sorry, I just want to find the... I had it written down somewhere, the, the Davidic prophecy. Hang on. You, you know, I don't know... Well, most people probably know the Davidic prophecy as something apo apocalyptic. But right. it's not actually that, that bad. Well, you, you also explain what apocalypse really means in the book. You define the term properly. Yeah, yeah. Apocalypse means the revelation of the knowledge of the gods, not right. God. Which uh, It's not me that defined that. That was some theologian and historians. They, they actually said that this is the true meaning of apocalypse. But, you know, right. the, 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 the cults, well, no cults, I guess they're mainstream these days, but the modern faiths have taken apocalypse to mean you know, the end of days and this sort of thing, yeah? But it's it's nowhere near that bad, uh, and I re I relate it back to the ark. In terms, of, they talk of tribulations and the apocalyptic types. They take the tri tribulations to be, you know, the end of the world, the sky is falling down, etc. But I t I take it to be the use up of resources, which they could have yeah. seen many times in the ancient world. I mean, you, you get a, a forest, two towns in it, as the towns grow. The forest is slowly decimated. Yeah, I see it here right. all the time in Cambodia. And mm -hmm. I, the family that they live over the river, the, the forest is now ten miles from their home, and it's only been twenty years. Yeah? Wow. And I assume this is going on everywhere as populations expand. But in the well, old sure. in the old world, this is more prosaic because you've only got wood to rely on. You don't have gas. You don't have oil. You don't have coal. Well, not right. much. You got goat crap, but <laughs> that's that's not that's not that's not my choice for cooking. But the Davidic prophecy. I mean, God's knowledge. I mean, that puts it back beyond the monotheistic religion. So it's many gods. The knowledge of the true gods, the older gods. Yeah. So we're at a time when there's many, many, many gods. I mean, the, the time of Abraham, the son, was a primary god amongst many gods. It's only at the time of Akhenaten that the god turned into a singular god, yeah, and they combined a lot of the a lot of the features. Now, if we're talking the Davidic prophecy, and can I, I just read? Well, read it. <clears throat> After great tribulation, the kingdom of God will be restored. Now, the kingdom of God is the tabernacle itself. Yeah. Yeah, which is the ark which is the ark. The Davidic tent will be re-established re for all peoples, and enlightenment will, will follow regarding the history of the world, and the past will be rewritten in a more correct light. The result will be the saving of the people and a new, brighter future for all. Well, if you run out of trees, what do you turn to? You've got, in the old world, you, you didn't have many choices. You, you had trees, you had animal extract, and, and you had right. the sun. And they're the pointing, this, I, I believe this happened many times in the old world. The, the, the slash and burners cleared landscapes, and as they finished clearing the landscapes, they had to turn to another technology to keep them warm to fuel their, fuel their lives. And I think they, they, they used the sun, and the, the knowledge of the solar techniques was, was basically held by the priest class. So they return to the fall and so forth, and it's kind of it's quite a nice message for today when we're sitting on yeah. here on the last few drops of oil. I don't know if anyone will pick it up, but maybe before that oil <laughs> runs out and we're all fighting over <laughs> the last the last barrel, maybe we can do something in turn to these old methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and at the same time, we're cutting down all the rainforests and all that other stuff as well. Exactly, the wood's gone. Yeah. I mean, this, this, some of the, this solar premise actually moves into this area. It shows you ways that this can be, uh, the only thing that we're interested in today is electricity and, and fuel for our cars. And the solar premise shows you how you can use the sun to generate electricity, store it 24-7, break those myths about, oh, sun doesn't come up at night, oh. Yeah, which always <laughs> stops people picking up on this stuff. But the, the ancients, the, the, the ark worked because it stored the heat of the sun in the stone. Right. 
and you used it when you needed it. The ark itself insulated the stone so the heat didn't escape. You can do the same today. In fact, some solar farms are built on exactly the same principle. They store the heat that they collect in big piles of stone and then extract it when they need it. So, so let me ask you this. How far back do you think this technology goes? Um, the ark itself, well, probably to the wood age, but the, I, I see this to the stone age, all the way to the stone age. Be, people are looking at stone circles and these strange stone structures from the Neoliths and before the Mesolith, but they're all pointing at the sun. And mm. if, you, if you want a good cave, you want the one which looks to the east in the morning, so you get warmed every, every day the sun comes up. Yeah, if, well, certainly if you're in a cold climate, the opposite here in the tropics. But right. You can see, I mean, my cat knows where the warm spot is. <laughs> this, is not, this, is not, this is not knowledge you have to be a super duper scientist to, to understand. It's very simple, basic stuff. And it goes all the way back to, I, I think, to the stone. I think the first, the first steps to civilization were about using the sun's energy. Yeah, people say it's fire, the managing fire more specifically. But, you know, everybody, <laughs> every animal knows the, the value of the sun. Yeah. yeah. It, it's so basic. And if you're building, if, if you're picking your cave, you want to pick one which has got a good sunny view if you're in a cold climate. And if you're in a warm climate, you want to pick one which is in the shade. Yeah, this is as fundamental as that. So I, I see these, this developing through the Stone Age. And the stone structures like Stonehenge and Avery and so forth, they, they utilize the sun in the same way as we do today. They leave their windows, big windows to the south, or where the sun comes up in the winter, and the smaller ones at the back. Hmm. Stonehenge and all these stone circles are the remnants of uh, Neolithic dwellings, roundhouses. No mystery. Okay. No mystery. <laughs> It's um, strange, but that's that's a that's a very long story. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, any thoughts on Gobekli Tepe? Another roundhouse. Another round building. So? Yeah. It's got the roof right. supports. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> I have a very simple view. <laughs> it explains a lot. <laughs> All those tombs. Same thing, but. I, I did compile a, a very long list of these strange structures and showed how, how, how even the heritage sites view them. I mean, Woodhenge, they put a, the English heritage put a roof on it. Stonehenge, no. <laughs> it's strange. You've got wooden building with a roof via the mainstream, but a, a, a solid stone one, which would act as a beautiful fort, no roof. The guy, uh, what's his name, uh, Bedlam, Bruce Bedlam, and a brilliant um, reconstruction with a solid roof on it. I think he goes a bit too far, but um, it's, it's the right idea. And all the stone circles, when they collapse, the, the walls around them, there's things called castros. Have you ever seen a castro? It's a Neolithic no. or Stone Age building. And it's basically a yurt with a stone wall around it, yeah? And when, over time, over a thousand years, all you've got left is the stone, which just falls down and to the ground and makes a nice circle. Call them circle cans. And this still, still happens today in uh, Tibet. The, the yak breeders, you know, when they're roaming across the hills. Whenever they leave their yurts or pack up and go somewhere else, they leave a ring of stones which used to hold down the yurt. yurt okay, uh, all right. Same with the teepees. All right. But well, where where can where can people find you online? Sorry, where can people find you online? Um, Secrets of the Sunsets and Christopher Jordan will get you there. Or the Ancient Solar Premise on WordPress, Amazon, uh, Smashwords. It's uh, the books. Uh, there's four four key books really. There's Secrets of the Sunset, which is a weighty tome, which is too much for most to read, but that covers uh, the, the whole gamut, but it's very difficult, mm -hmm. you have to jump about a lot. But the ancient solar premise is the key one, and it gives you an idea of the actual physical um, remnants and how they were used and how you can reconstruct these things yourself. Yeah. Then there's the Ark of the Covenant Operations Manual, which is what we've been discussing today. And that tells right. you how to build it in detail and how to do these techniques in detail. Don't have to take my word for it. It's not like you don't have to find any strange materials. You can take the materials out of your kitchen. 
<laughs> then there's <laughs> then there's the sun devices, which is a more tech-based one, which just takes these old technologies and shows them shows how they can be used today. Which I basically wrote for the NGOs so that they didn't have to dabble with the ark and so forth, make them uncomfortable in their Christian way. But then the, and then and then the last last book is the Great Pyramid Rainmaker, which shows you how. The Great Pyramid was built in stages and how each stage worked and how it huh. devolved to the mess that it is today. But oh, that, they're, okay. all, they're all basically under the solar, solar theme. Yeah. Hmm. There's a couple of papers there as well on, I think one of them's free, the Archimedes, the math behind burning mirrors. It shows how Archimedes worked, and that's for people who want to use high energy fluxes uh, for researchers and so forth. All right. Anything coming up? Um, I have one in the pipeline, but it's on Stone Age settlements, which okay. which will upset even more people, certainly in the old community. <laughs> <laughs> and the mainstream. I, I don't have any luck. This stuff is never going to be popular. <laughs> it's, it's not. Oh, I don't know. But, so uh, hopefully well, your show will put it out there a bit more. All right. Well, I, 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 I've, I've only read the one we talked about today, but I, I really enjoyed it. It's very well written, and it, has, it makes a very good argument for what you're talking about. Well, I, hope, I hope people try it out. Not the hard stuff, but the easy stuff. There's some easy how-to-dos in there, which anyone can try. Don't, right. even, well, don't think... even have to make anything. Just pick it out your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> Well, I thank you, Christopher, and uh, we're going to take you out appropriately with Mechanisms Bring Back the Sun. Yeah, thanks you for having me on the show, Soraya. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.